Good morning, and on behalf of your family here at United Baptist Church, welcome to our worship service this morning. Oh, my goodness, and what a glorious day it is. Here, January 1st, the first day of the first week of the first month of a new year. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, and it is with joy that we come before you this morning celebrating after celebrating the birth of Jesus just last week on Christmas. And now we can come together and look ahead to the brand new year together. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for tuning in to the radio station there that you're listening to. Or maybe you've clicked on ubctopsum.org and, and clicked on the message link there and you're watching with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness, where to begin? Well, with the joke of the day, of course. <laughs> Our joke. And uh, this time of New Year's resolutions and all, I think I've found mine here. Uh, I am on a new grapefruit diet since this year. Yes, it is. I really believe that I can stick with it the whole year long. I can eat everything except grapefruit. Yes. <laughs> oh, anyway. Oh, how many of us like to watch the TV uh, mi murder mystery kind of solving shows, you know, CSI or NCIS or, or something along those lines? You know, the ones where that Cracker Jack team gets together and they figure out the murder mystery of the week. In the old days, we had like Perry Mason or Matt Locke or Agatha Christie. Yep, yep. Uh, they solved the mysteries with interviews and evaluating contradicting stories, and they put in their own gut feelings on what to happen. Well, nowadays, these shows today, they use more of the modern approaches, right? <laughs> yes. I realize that some of them, some of the tests and some of the stuff that they do on these modern shows are just made for TV. Those tests really don't exist, but there are some of them that they are able to utilize that really do exist. You know, there are the DNA, they can do the fiber testing and all of that stuff. 
Now, sometimes they stretch it just a little bit as they could come to the conclusion of the murder mystery by just one hair follicle or just uh, one strand of thread. <laughs> and they can tell guilt or innocence from just that one thing. But one of the, one of the things that I do find fascinating, and, and they do actually use the, this particular test when they're trying to determine if a particular gun was used in the crime itself. They take the gun that they suspect was the cause uh, that, 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 uh, that was shot in order to cause the, the, the murder, and they fire it into a glob, a jello-like substance that is supposed to be the same consistency of a human body. It's a, it's a substitute material, okay, from that, so they don't have to actually fire it into somebody just to see. But they, they'll fire it into this gel, this glob, this goop, and they will take that bullet out of that glob, and they will compare it to the bullet that was taken out of the murdered person. And they, from that, they can determine whether this was the gun that was used in, in the crime. So they use a substitute material. They don't use the, the, the human body itself. Along those same lines in Hollywood, of course, or wherever they're making a movie, when they come to a particular scene in the movie, when they come to that one that, that might be too dangerous for that multimillionaire actor to be put in such a position where they might get hurt, <laughs> the director may shout out, cut! And the star of the show is replaced with what they call a stunt double. They film the dangerous sequence with the double, and then when all is settled, the actor again takes their place as their role. Why would they do such a thing? Uh, if it's not safe for one person, why would it be safe for the other? <laughs> well, we know that the stunt people have special training, and uh, they know how to fall out of buildings without getting hurt. But then we wonder why they can't just use a stunt dummy or something like they use in the crash tests in cars, you know, those Funny looking figures that got the yellow and black circles on the sides of them. Yeah. <laughs> but what the director of the movie is looking for is the real body movements of a real person. They could have used one of those dummies, but it wouldn't react in the same way as a human body. It's just not the same material. Again, they are substituting something for the real thing. Let's take a look at our scripture this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, starting at verse 10. We're going to read through verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children of God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, we too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful 
and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let us pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for this glorious day. Again, Lord, a brand new start to a brand new day, a brand new week, a brand new month, a brand new year. A time where we can set aside to refocus our thoughts and our minds and to recommit ourselves to those things that are important in our lives. Oh, Far too many times we get down the road and we find ourselves off chasing different things or or going different directions. But here and now, Lord, we can make that commitment to you and to come back into that right relationship with you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the scripture this morning that will remind us and thank you for the love that you displayed for each of us that we just celebrated last week at Christmas. Thank you for that love and grace. And Father, right here and now, I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Here we look at this passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews. Now, we remember that we really don't know who wrote this particular book. Nobody says at the beginning that they were the author. Uh, Some some think because of its style, it it may have been Paul, but Paul usually identifies himself. Some think that others may have been uh, the author, including Luke, or maybe Barnabas, Apollo, Silas, Philip, Priscilla, (laughs) or a number of others just by the style and how they, they worded it and, and all those things. But one thing we do know for sure about the author of Hebrews is that the reason, and the, and the reason why it's included in our Bibles today, is that without a doubt, without a doubt, this person had first-hand contact with Jesus himself. It was a follower of Jesus, and this person wrote from a spirit-led heart. Those are the things uh, and the reasons why the book of Hebrews was included in our canon, in our scriptures. Whoever wrote this letter, or maybe even some consider this to be a a sermon. (laughs) Can you believe how long that sermon would have been? But some believe it wasn't necessarily a letter, but a sermon that was to be given to the Hebrew Christians who were facing persecution. And and this persecution was coming from what seemed like every direction, all sides. On one side, there was the Romans that at this point in time uh, had, had accused the Christians of the ones that being the ones that set the fire to Rome that burned down the city of Rome. Uh, And then on the other side, we have the Jewish folks that are blaming the Christians, putting pressure on them because they claim to be Christ followers. They claim to be followers of Jesus of Nazareth and uh, his promise of coming back. And they looked around and says, well, where is he at? He promised he'd come back. Obviously, he's not So you just need to come on back to to your roots. Come on back to the Jewish beliefs. Come on back home and just settle in back with us here as, as, uh, as Jews. But here in the middle of this writing of this unknown author of the book of Hebrews, we find this passage. This passage that we read just a moment ago, it's a wonderful portion that reminded those folks back then, those Christians back then, and us here today, what a truly amazing thing that God provided for us in what Jesus did for each of us. Why 
did Jesus come to earth as a man? Born of a virgin, he grew and matured for about, uh, best we can tell, about 33 years. He walked the ground. He knew the highs and the lows. He knew the dry desert and the luscious valleys. He breathed the air, smelled the freshness after a rain, felt the cool breeze as it came in off the sea. He knew the taste of dust as it raised from the ground on a hot summer's day. He smelled the fresh bread as it baked, tasted the grilled fish hot off the fire. And he knew what it was like also to be hungry, to travel from place to place. Nowhere did he call home. He felt the pressures of life also, the pain and the sorrow, the betrayal of someone that was close the false accusations he heard. And he knew death itself. Death that for anyone else meant that Satan was still in control of this world. Because we remember ever since Adam and Eve listened to the devil's deceit and, he, and disobeyed God, Satan held the power of death. No man could stand against death. No man could do it no matter what. It is each of our destiny. No matter what, we're going to die. And that, up until that point, Satan held the keys. Yet when Jesus died on that cross, we could almost imagine Satan gleefully sneering, right? <laughs> there. <laughs> That's done. And we can see in our minds Satan dancing over that grave when they laid Jesus to rest. He probably nodded with a, an approving nod when they sealed the grave with that boulder. And as he walked away, dusting off his hands, as if to say, that wasn't nothing. God, what else you got? Is that all you got? <laughs> that was Friday. That was Friday. Saturday came about, Satan still feeling pretty good about what he was able to accomplish, maybe turning his thoughts towards those disciples and those followers that followed Jesus. What could he do to them? Oh, the plans that may have been drawn up. And then Sunday. Sunday morning was different. Maybe Sunday, Satan didn't know why. Things just didn't feel right. They just didn't feel the same. And then the sheer terror that strikes Satan himself as the ground begins to shake. With eyes filled with terror, he looks up to see the stone to be rolled away and Jesus standing before him, taking those keys away, those keys of sin and death. No longer is Satan in power. Jesus rose again, displaying to everyone his dominance over Satan and the world and offering to all those who believe in him the promise of eternal life. And while we are still here on this earth, Jesus now intercedes for us at the Father's right hand, the position of authority and power. The scripture says that he is our high priest. The symbol that folks back in that day when this was written fully recognized because it was the high priest that uh, in the Jewish religion that, that stands in between God and the people. It is the high priest now, Jesus, who stands in that gap for us. What did we do to deserve such a benefit from God? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. He has provided it because he loves us that much. In the realm of eternity, 
when the scene is set for the most horrific ending of all time, when we are exposed to what we deserve in punishment for our sinful nature, our own death, spiritually, yes, when we find ourselves in that situation, God stands up and hollers, cut! And Jesus, our double, comes and he takes away the pain and the sorrow. He stands in our place at that particular point in time and he takes it away so completely that when we stand before God and the Father looks upon us, all he sees is Jesus. Jesus can do that because he knows what it's like. He came in the flesh and he came in flesh and blood. It wasn't some massive gel. It wasn't some spirit or ghost. He came as one of us. He celebrated. We celebrated his birth here just last week. He understands. He knows. And he did it. And he still is on our side because he loves us. No one made him do it. <laughs> Satan even tried to get him to take an alternate course, right? We remember Satan and those three temptations right after Jesus' baptism when he was out in the desert. Each one of those temptations offered Jesus an easier way. And yet each one of those temptations, the benefit was only for Jesus himself. It would have meant death for the rest of us. It would have meant death if Jesus would have given in to any of those temptations. <laughs> but the great news is he did not give in to those temptations he didn't give in. And as a result, Jesus paid the sin price for each and every one of us. He went all the way through God's perfect plan for you and for me. In this beginning of a brand new year, let's make our commitment to him whether it is a first-time commitment, whether you are just hearing this, that Jesus loves you so much that he came to earth for you, and you've decided that you want to follow him, and you're saying, yes, what do I need? We commit ourselves to him. If we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And that saving comes as we commit ourselves to him and we make that commitment to him right here and right now. Or maybe maybe in, over the course of our lives, we've made that initial uh, decision but we've strayed. We've taken a wrong turn. We've, we've gone a little different direction and we know that it's not right. This new year, we can come back to God and be reconciled, be brought back into that right relationship with him through what we realize and what we were reminded of this morning, Jesus's love for each of us and what he did for us. We may have strayed away, but we can come back together. A first time decision or, or the decision to recommit. Let's make 2023 the year that we come back to God and to, to follow him through what Jesus did for us. Let us pray. Father, again, I thank you for this time and I thank you for what it means that Jesus came to earth for us. I thank you that your love for each of us is such that if we were the only person in all of time and history, Jesus would have done it for us. 
Father, that love is so complete. That love is, is so omnipotent. That love is surrounding us. And Lord, we just want to rest and to be a part of that love of yours. Not for just today, but for all eternity. And that eternity starts right here and right now. Thank you, Father. And gracious God, we come before you now, not only with our thoughts, not only with our, with our words or our hearts, but Lord, we come before you with our voices raised in praise and in prayer as together we say that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.